All right. So creating custom grids part three. At this point, we've already worked through understanding how to make the five different grids. We've talked last time about combining those grids and using um, some different design um, practices to using scale and contrast and really kind of trying to explore what we can do with the two grids. But now we're gonna look at what else we can do and what are the other elements we can bring into creating um, these grids. So um, we're gonna start as, uh, always with the standard grid. Um, so we wanna always, as we move into making these custom grids, we're gonna start with a, a standard grid, whether that's you know a square grid, a polar grid, isometric grid or hex grid. And then we're gonna add new elements in the desired sizes and quickly experiment with different arrangements. So the first thing we're gonna look at is repeatability and edges. Um, the nice thing about geometric design is it really lends itself to patterns. And also you can make it as a pattern tile or without a pattern tile. And let's talk about what those two differences are. So uh, an individual design isn't worried about a pattern uh, per se. So it's just about that taking the square and really building something. In it. So here you can see a square grid with a polar grid and then lines added. And then the square grid taken away and now focusing on just the circular elements and some of the diagonal lines filled in the development of the design, and then things like texture um, are added on top. A pattern tile, on the other hand, here's an example of square grid, a polar grid, and concentric squares, and how that looks like when it's patterned, how then the design is developed from that pattern with color and pattern on top. When we're thinking about making a pattern tile, we need to think about the edges. The edges are what's going to matter whenever we're creating a pattern. So here's examples of different ways you can engage and in involve the edges. Spacing and arrangement of elements is another thing we're going to be considering as we're developing our grids. So thinking about spacing with gaps, maybe having your elements touching, um, and also exploring overlapping elements. You can think about concentric placement. Here's an example of a concentric placement and offset center placement. This idea of bringing in shapes, circles, squares, along with your grids. There's concentric placement and offset center placement. Another example. You can also fit elements within one another in concentric um, centered style. So here you can see there's a circle with a pentagram, with a star, with a hexagon, with the circle, and you know, on and on. So it's just all layered, centered right on top of each other, creating. Uh, a design. Symmetry and balance. So this is something we've talked a little bit about already, but just to kind of further develop that conversation is we're looking at, do we want our grids, we want to have some that are symmetrical and we want to have some that are asymmetrical. Also, we can think about linear symmetry and rotational symmetry. emphasis, thinking about a grid with a focal point. Um, again, using lines, shapes, uh, bringing in the polar grid makes sense for the, the focal point. But then also thinking about with now, without an obvious focal point, what is, does it have to be? So you can have ones with and without. Movement and direction. Here's an example of those overlapping shapes 
really uh, creating a static grid because they're uh, centered, centered and, and not feeling like they're moving at the moment. But then you also have this dynamic grid where you have these zigzags bringing us into a direction, kind of telling us which direction to look. Um, and then how do those translate when we move into the design phase, right? Also the way you color it. Now the, the static grid feels like it has movement the way we're coloring the circles and the way we're interpreting those designs. Dynamic composition with leading lines. You can see the arc tool used in this one uh, and really successfully. And then you can also see this idea of concentric circles with elements changing scale as it goes across the design. Speaking of scale, let's talk about scale and pro proportion. Bringing in elements, um, looking at the scale of those different elements. So here's an example of element sizes changing in regular steps, right? One, one plus one, two plus one, three plus one, just one increment up as it goes. Um, incrementally changing sizes by multiplication of a common ratio, right? By three, for example, in this one, or even looking at if we make a irregular square grid and then having these circles fit each square diagonally across to scale it according to our grid, our um, irregular grid that we've developed. Um, we can use the Fibonacci sequence for all of us that are fans of the golden mean, uh, we can definitely bring that into our grid design. And the Fibonacci sequence, each number is the sum of the two preceding ones. So here's some examples of using shapes in different scale based on the Fibonacci, uh, Fibonacci sequence. Or we can even bring in the golden mean and bring the whole golden ratio in with the spiral and look at a design that's maybe not square, but more rectangular and using the golden mean as our, as our design um, principle. Here I have, uh, in this PDF I have up on uh, Blackboard as well, for us to look at the what, all of these that we just talked about. So when we're thinking about when you're like, I just don't know what else I can do to make a custom grid. These are some things I want you to think about. Format use, repeat, repeating um, the edges, um, spacing of elements, uh, appearance of elements, balance, emphasis, movement, and just and direction. So these are all elements and things that we can add to help us think through all the different ways we can further develop our grids.